Hi, everybody. My name is Molly Kirkland. I am the Director of Public Affairs for the Southern California Rental Housing Association. We are an over 100-year-old trade association serving the needs of rental housing owners, managers, and the companies that provide services to rental properties. Thank you for joining us today. Um, our guest today is a property owner and a, one of my committee members on the legislative steering committee, so he helps guide some of our policy decisions at the association. Patrick Kappel. Patrick, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Molly. So before I launch into my hard-hitting questions, why don't you take a moment and tell everybody how you became involved in rental housing and what motivated you to get involved? So that's, that's a question that's definitely combined. What motivated me and how, what, what got me into it? And I can think of two key items that got me into the rental housing industry and what motivated me. Uh, the first one, all the way back to childhood, is I, my family lost our home as a child and I would have been homeless on the street if it wasn't for my grandparents that took my family in. And I always like to say I graduated high school in my grandparents' basement because that's where I was living. And my, my parents both lost their jobs, we lost our homes. We had a medical emergency in the family that led to all of that. So I totally understand uh, housing insecurity. And I understand how one bad medical situation can bring someone from middle class to homeless. Uh, Cause that happened to my family. And during that time living in my grandparents' home throughout the rest of high school, we had to move two hours away, a different town, a different high school. It was some, somewhat traumatic, but it also made me realize the value of having a home and just how important it was. And I knew I didn't want to be in that position again myself. Coming out of high school, I enlisted in the Navy. Because again, we had no money. I, I wasn't going to college. My parents couldn't put me through college. So two weeks after high school, I was in the Navy. And one of my, one of my very first mentors in the Navy, I'll never forget the guy's name. He said, Patrick, your first military duty station, buy a house. I don't care if, if you can live on base for free. I don't care if rent is cheaper than owning. He said, buy a house. And if you can't afford a house, buy a condo but buy something, live in it for two years, and then move out and at your next duty station, buy your second home and turn that first one into a rental. And I followed that chief's advice. And when I was in my mid twenties, I bought my first property, it was a condo. And it wasn't in a neighborhood I wanted to live in. And it wasn't a condo I wanted to live in, but it was what I could afford. And that's why I bought it. I bought what I could afford. And I never left San Diego. That was well over a decade ago. I've lived in San Diego ever since. So I wasn't able to follow his advice and move duty stations and buy a new property, but I followed his advice. And in between every military deployment, I saved all my money on that deployment and I would come back and buy a new property. And I did multiple deployments back and forth to the Middle East. And where most guys come back home from a deployment, they spend their money maybe on a new car, I would spend mine on a new property, a new condo, a new townhome. And I would turn the last one that I had been living in into a rental and each year buy a new property in between those military deployments. So that's what got me into it. It was probably my childhood that motivated me. And it was my military mentors that really gave me that direction. And it was my military deployments that gave me the means uh, to buy real estate here in San Diego. That's a really great background to learn. Um, did you ever get an opportunity to thank that chief for the advice? I have not seen that chief <laughs> since, but I have had the opportunity to pay it back. And we always say, you know, you can pay it back and it doesn't have to be to the same person, but you can pay it back in so many other ways. And what I do now is uh, I still serve in the Navy. I've been in 21 years now. I'm in the Navy Reserve, but I transitioned out from active duty to the Navy Reserves to follow my passion, and that's real estate. On active duty, I ended up acquiring four properties. And I learned through practice that I went from truly being, you know, uh, on the economic scale of America. We say, you know, you have lower class and middle class and upper class. And everyone thinks these real estate property owners and landlords are upper class. I was lower class when I moved to San Diego. I, I, I joined the Navy because I had no money. Um, my parents didn't have a house. They didn't have a job. And I was what you would call lower class when I started out. And 
uh, I was able to go from that lower class and kind of move up the ladder of the American dream through real estate. And after about a decade in the military, I had four properties. And I started realizing that my financial security was being created through real estate ownership more so than a retirement account, more so than a job. And I said, you know what I want to do? I want to help other people do what I've done. Um, so now I work as a realtor and I've made a passion and a career out of helping other folks, a lot of them young folks in their 20s and in their 30s, helping them achieve financial security by buying investment real estate. Oftentimes their first investment property is their house. They're investing in themselves. And maybe they buy a four bedroom and they rent out three. Or maybe they buy a duplex and they live in one unit and they rent out the, the other. But that's how I helped that chief. His name was Chief McGrath. And I paid him back by paying it back to all the young folks that are following in my footsteps. And I'd say half my clients are military. And it's young military men and women that are buying a duplex and renting out one unit and living in the other. That's great. It's so great that you're able to you know, pay it forward, so to speak. And I should say thank you for your previous service and your continued service. Uh, you never quite got away. <laughs> and, and, and no. Maybe it's fortunate. No. <laughs> Just this last weekend, I was in a uniform serving on base. Uh, I'm the commanding officer of a Navy Reserve unit here with about 60 people in it. You are a busy guy, that's for sure. So, um, you know, you, you brought up the folks that you help and how they get invested. And I think that's a nice segue into the next question. And that is, you know, there's a perception out there in the ether of what a rental housing owner looks like or is. And, you know, we spend a good chunk of our time at the association trying to dispel those myths and really share the stories of who property owners are like yourself. What do you wish that more people knew about the rental housing industry and rental property owners? Look, the, the rental housing industry is like a lot of other industries in America. And, and I'll use one as uh, kind of a parallel is restaurants. The vast majority of restaurants are not McDonald's owned by some big corporate. And even the McDonald's franchise owned the vast majority of restaurants are individually mom and pop owned, family owned. That is their sole source or at least a primary source of their income. And the vast majority of housing providers in the United States and certainly in San Diego and California are not, not large corporations. It's not large cor corporations owning big skyscrapers and apartment buildings. It's everyday mom and pop owners, it's military veterans, it's nurses, it's teachers, it's construction workers. Uh, I can't tell you how many electricians and plumbers I know that own investment real estate. And it's blue collared, sweat of the earth type of American that own the majority of rental property. And there's a misperception out there because the perception is, a rental property owner owns a 20 or 30 unit apartment complex. It's gotta be a corporation, millions of dollars. The reality is a large portion of rental units out there are in buildings that are two to four units or certainly 10 units and less, especially in Southern California where we have a lot of smaller scale investment properties. And these properties, they're not owned free and clear. They often have a lot of debt behind them. And that construction worker, that teacher, that nurse, my wife's nurse, I was a military guy, there's a perfect example. We bought those taking on risk, um, yet that is there to really hopefully subsidize our retirement. So it's really sweat of the earth type of people. And a lot of times in America, we always say the American dream and moving up the ladder in America. There are few ways to move up that ladder other than real estate. And my, my case specifically, and many others like mine, real estate ownership provides the ability to go from lower class to middle class, lower middle class to upper middle class. And I just hope that folks understand that, that behind that building is a nurse, a teacher, a military member, a doctor, you know, your kid's school bus driver. That's who's behind the majority of the buildings out there, not some LLC without a face. That's... I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for saying that. Um, 
So transi transitioning a little bit to the association and your involvement there, like I mentioned, Patrick is on the Legislative Steering Committee and he brings a lot of good insight uh, into our policy recommendations and the like. On the other side of things, how has the association helped you over the years and in particular during the pandemic? It's helped me a lot. You know, over the years, I certainly appreciate all the forms that the association provides that have been checked by attorneys and everything from a rental form to, you know, a move out, move out inspection form. Um, but also even more importantly, the, the monthly and sometimes weekly emails that we get about new legislation that's being passed. It helps me in multiple ways. One, as an owner, it keeps my knowledge level high. I know what's going on. I'm not ignorant uh, to new regulations affecting California housing. Also, as uh, beyond being an owner, as you know, I'm a realtor and there's a lot of business professionals that join the association. Some of them maybe don't own real estate, but they join the association to better advise their clients. And I have found that the association, even if I wasn't an owner, the association, just the knowledge it provides me to share with my clients is invaluable. And oftentimes my clients call me first because they know I have this direct attachment to the Southern California Rental Housing Association and I can share the knowledge of politically what's going on. And then last but not least, politically. As I mentioned, I see both sides of the coin having gone through housing, housing insecurity as a child and um, now being a landlord myself. I see both sides of the coin. And um, you often hear me say, Molly, I believe the best thing to do in our society is not what is in the best interest of the individual, but what is in the best interest of society. And when I think about all the political regulations that are being passed or even just considered, I don't ask myself what's best for the landlord. I don't ask myself what's best for the tenant. I ask myself, what is best for society? What is best for San Diego County? What is best for California? Because if we're always trying to appease one person or one class of person, we will never win. But if we are always trying to appease the greater good, we will always win. And I think that's something I, I, I take from the Navy. And as you know, you know, military and military backgrounds, we're always taught, sometimes you gotta you know, sacrifice. And sometimes you gotta sacrifice one or two for the greater good of the ship, of the submarine, of the aircraft, of the division, the platoon, the command. And that's how I look at things holistically. Not what's best for landlords, not what's best for tenants, what's best for society. And when I look at the, the regulations that are up politically, that's the angle I take. And, and the apartment association, I like that um, our rental housing association gives a clear view of the um, pros and cons behind each piece of legislation that's put up. And from, from the association, it's never, hey, we should vote this way because it's gonna make more money for landlords. I've never heard that. What I always hear is we should vote this way because it's for the best of California in our housing crisis. It's for the best of San Diego in our housing crisis. It's gonna put more people in homes. And I've never heard the association say, it's gonna put more money in your pockets. I've always heard you guys say it's going to put more people in homes. And that's really what I like about the association. I really appreciate hearing that. I, um, you know, obviously I'm a little biased since some of the information you talked about um, is pushed out by my department, but we do spend a great deal of time working on that. And so we're glad that that's been beneficial to you and that you can share that with clients and colleagues. But more than that, I, I really appreciate you saying that about how we approach uh, legislation and ordinances. And you're right, uh, money is never an issue when we're weighing those kinds of decisions. What we're looking for is housing people, market stability, and making sure that you know our members and other folks can provide rental housing now and, and well into the future. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, why we're on kind of that more holistic society kind of topic, have you ever had a resident that has really made an impact on you that maybe had you change a policy or go out and start volunteering or you know, something like that in another kind of issue area? 
Yeah, I, I have. And I can think of her name. Her name was Diane. And she rented one of my properties. In fact, she rented the first property I ever bought in my life. And um, I moved out at a little condo in Bonita. And she, uh, she was and she is a widow. And she's on a fixed income. And she needed a place uh, to rent. And I ended up leasing out that, that condo to her. And it was one of my first landlord experiences ever. And every time I would come by to uh, fix something or you name it, you know, sometimes it was as simple as turning on the furnace for her. And uh, I, I knew I was going there to turn on a furnace and that's gonna take two minutes, but I knew I was gonna be there for an hour um, because we're gonna talk about her life and we're gonna talk about her husband who she had lost uh, a few years back. And um, I think that was really important to her, just to have someone to talk with. And uh, a lot of our tenants are on these fixed incomes. And as landlords, we're not just their landlord. Um, sometimes we're uh, an ear to listen to their story. We're a sounding board for them. Um, sometimes we're the son that she doesn't have. And I can go over there and turn on a furnace for her, you know? Um, and when I thought about that, when I, when I think about her, I, I didn't raise her rent. You know, each year rents keep going up in San Diego, right? And I didn't raise her rent because I, I, I saw my mom and her when I looked at her. And I, I, I knew that, hey, if I raise rent $40, it's not going to change my life, but it might change her life. So I wouldn't raise it. Um, and I thought about that a lot throughout this last year of COVID. And I thought about that a lot when rent control got passed. And this brings me back to what I say, what's best for the greater good, okay? And with the passage of rent control, as you know, there's limits now on how much a person can raise rent. Um, and you could have a tenant uh, such as this, and you don't raise rent on them for five years, for 10 years, because they're a good person. Um, a good relationship, they're on a fixed income, you name it, and you just got a good heart and you don't want to raise their rent. Um, the challenge we have now in California is if I ever wanted to sell that property and the rents are, say, $1,000 below market value, I'm going to sell that property likely hundreds of thousands less than what it would be worth otherwise. 24 months ago, if that property is worth 600,000, it would sell for 600,000 um, because an investor could buy it and raise rents. And is it tough on that lady that she's gonna get raise, rents raised after an investor buys it? Absolutely. Um, but instead what we're doing is artificially devaluing property based on mom and pop landlords like myself, artificially keeping rents low out of the goodness of, out of their hearts. So now to, uh, I always say out of every good intended piece of legislation, there's unintended negative consequences. And I think that negative consequence now is some landlords are gonna look at the reality and they're gonna say, you know what? I want to artificially keep this tenant's rent low. Good tenant, I wanna keep that rent low. But due to rent control, if I keep that rent artificially low by 400 bucks a month, as far as the value of this asset, it's going to keep that value down tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there's real estate finance reasons behind that, which we don't have to get into today. Um, but I believe, I believe it's a certainty because it's economics 101 and finance 101. You are going to have landlords now raising rent more often and more dramatically than they would have otherwise to these tenants that might've been on a fixed income and you wanted to keep the rent artificially low. And when rent control got passed, I thought of Diane. And I thought, I asked myself, with this new rent control, would I have kept Diane's rent fixed for four years, five years? And the answer to that is no. And I'm a good person, but I still wouldn't because I'm not going to, you know, uh, shoot myself in the foot um, just to be uh, 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 keeping someone's rent below market value. So these are just things, you know, I, I'm not saying what's right and wrong. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> but I, I do look at things from a holistic perspective. And I think that in, in a society like San Diego, it's best to have, uh, or America, to have a free market, to have a free market. And um, landlords are not mean people. They are not. Um, most of them are 
like I said, doctors, teachers, and nurses and military folks, at least the ones I know. And I work with a lot of landlords. Yeah. You know, you know, that's a sweet story about Diane. And I think there's a lot of property owners like yourself who go, like you said, they go over to, to fix something that should take a few minutes and end up hanging out and chatting and, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it's nice that there's that relationship um, in the industry, but you do raise a really good point about the rent caps. And when that legislation passed, we told the legislature, this is going to have the unintended consequence of people actually raising rent. And it has absolutely done that. And I know that because I talk to owners and managers every day who want to know how much they can raise it. And and especially when the law first passed, they would lead with, I haven't raised rent on this unit in 10 years, five years, you know, three years, ever. And, you know, they would sometimes be in Pacific Beach on the water, you know, or, or some things like mm -hmm. that, where otherwise the rent would be much higher. And so you're right, property owners over the years have traditionally prioritized good long-term tenants over rent increases because they knew they had the flexibility one day if need be. But yeah. when you put rent caps in place, you not only do you create fear, you know, in, in the um, owner and manager kind of arena because now you're wondering if you can ever catch up and, and that kind of thing, but you raise a really good point that it, if and when you go to sell that property, they're going to be looking at what you can get potentially for rent. And if you weren't keeping up and that kind of thing, it could shoot you in the foot and, and rent control is, is known obviously to, to limit what future rents can be and that can impact sales. So it's a really kind of interesting point you bring up. And, and the other thing, and I should have mentioned this too, that Diana makes me think of and really certainly with COVID-19 is the eviction moratorium as landlords, we are willing to give a lot of people a chance, second, third, fourth, fifth chances. Um, and um, Dana wasn't the type of person that needed a chance, but she was the type of person that didn't have necessarily the best credit. You find this a lot, especially with widows, um, uh, single women that are perhaps, you know, uh, older and living on their own in a fixed income, but most of the finances were funneled through their husband or he was the breadwinner. And now you have a, sing, a single uh, older person without the credit score or the income that is required. And previously, as a landlord, I can say for myself, and I'm sure many others would share the sentiment, I was willing to take risk. And I was willing to say, look, you, I'll, I'll rent this place to you. You seem like a, you know, a nice person. You're going to pay the rent. Um, and I'll have lower credit requirements and lower income requirements. Because worst case scenario, if you stop paying rent, I'm not going to go bankrupt. I'm not going to foreclose because the government will back me up and say, hey, you're kind of in a roundabout way stealing. Um, just like walking into a restaurant and eating food and not paying the bill. You're renting this place and not paying the bill. And I can assure you if I walked into st uh, a restaurant and ordered a hundred dollar meal and walked out without paying and they caught me, it would not be a good day for me. But once the government starts allowing tenants to have so many protections and landlords to have so few protections that an individual can continuously live in a property and get a free lunch, eat a free meal, and that landlord is subsidizing it, because let's be clear, the landlord is subsidizing it, not the government, the landlord is. Um, you're asking one person to subsidize something instead of asking a city, a county, a state, or a country to help subsidize folks. Um, that landlord is going to take less risk. That landlord is going to take less risk. And people like Diane and people without the best credit, people without the best income, people with a bankruptcy, they are going to have a more difficult time securing housing than they would otherwise. Now, if the government said, hey, if someone stops paying you rent, we'll help you get them out in 30 days, I would rent to anyone, anyone. Probably wouldn't even do a credit check. Right. Um, but when the government says uh, they're going to live there, they, they can stop paying rent and live there for a year plus, and Mr. Landlord, you got to keep paying the mortgage and whatnot, but they don't, um, you're going to have a higher bar of entry. And that is, what does that do? What does that do? 
San Diego is getting more and more highly paid folks. We'll always find those. It's going gonna, it's gonna to eliminate the housing for the lower income folks, the lower credit score folks. Uh, it's going to eliminate the housing for them. Yeah. So we, we really need to support, I'm not saying just support landlords. We need to support everyone equally. No, I think that's a really good point. And it is a, it is a, um, I don't want to say, you know, we're all in this together. That's a cliche and everybody. I love that it. though. I mean. But that is true all the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the landlord doesn't exist without the tenant. The tenant doesn't have a house without the landlord. You know, it is this kind of circle of life in, in this industry that nobody exists without the other. And, you know, in a way it's symbiotic and eat one another and it shouldn't be an us versus them. And, I, I always joke that I'm a Libra, so I like balance, and I would love to see more balance in the regulation out there. Uh, so folks like yourself aren't finding themselves having to worry about risk so much and having to work their policies around the potential for for risk later on down the road. Um, mm -hmm. You you know you brought up another point that I think is good to touch on. You mentioned. Diane and maybe having lower credit um, and it reminds me that the rental housing industry in general will respond accordingly to the marketplace you know and not only in this pandemic you know a year ago or so when it first started did we see that from owners and managers stepping forward to work with their residents on payment plans and you know rescinding rent increases and a bunch of different other things we saw this you know however many years it's been now at the, after the last recession, where lots of owners and, and even larger management companies were adjusting their credit requirements and their other rental criteria, recognizing that a lot of people may have been impacted by the recession or maybe had their home foreclosed upon. And the market responded at that time. And you would see things like, um, you know, no security deposit move in. I, I heard of communities giving away televisions to get people to rent there. And that was the mark, that was the industry responding to the market at the time. And I think the rental housing industry in particular is really good about doing that and will step up and do it um, on their own. We don't need necessarily government to step in and, and tell us, but there is a tipping point where, yeah. you know, the owner, like you said, can't subsidize somebody you know, in perpetuity. Well, and as you said, we will respond. When the pandemic hit, I've got a, a single mother that rents one of my properties and her three daughters, and all of them have jobs in the restaurant industry. The, the single mother actually does uh, works for the school district in her three daughters' restaurant industry, and they all lost their jobs like that. And she called me up and she said, hey, I don't think I can pay all of the rent this month. And I said, I get it. Look, pay what you can pay now. And once you can pay later, pay it later. I get it. Well, I mean, what, what can I do, right? It's, you, can't, you can't squeeze water out of the rock. And all landlords know that. We're not going to go beat on someone's door that we know doesn't have a job. But communication was so important, you know? And that goes two ways, that communication. Absolutely. Sometimes, and I've been there too, where you have the tenant, it just goes dark on you. Just goes dark, okay? And um, ever since I was a five-year-old, I learned from my teachers and on in the military that it's usually the one who's not communicating that is at fault. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important for tenants to communicate. I think it's important for landlords to communicate and, and stay mature, just be adults. If you can't pay a rent, call your landlord. 99 out of 100 times, that landlord's going to say, I got it. Let's just have you pay it on the back end or pay it when you can pay it. Yep. That's the way to do it. I did the same thing with my entire real estate team when the pandemic hit. We didn't know what direction real estate was going to go. And I, I called all my agents and I said, look, I don't know if any of us is going to make a paycheck in the next few months. Real estate really slowed down. But if any of you need money, call me and I'll give you an interest-free loan. And that's effectively what we did with those tenants too. You know, um, there's, I always say there's no free lunch, right? But you can give interest-free lunches. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's what a lot of landlords did. Uh, to help their tenants out, and I did as well. That's great. Yeah, we, we appreciate that, and there's countless others out there who have done that, and, um, you know, thank you to all of you watching who have done similar things. We will uh, be highlighting more folks and, and thanking 
the industry publicly going forward for what you all have done during this pandemic and stepping forward. Um, I have a feeling, Patrick, that you and I could probably sit here and go back and forth all day, but I, I know you're busy. Um, I want to give you an opportunity. Be, you know, we, we know you're, you're, you've got your real estate business and you're still with the Navy, but I know you do more than that too. And if I, if memory serves, you were back in school a few years ago, and I believe you, you know you're a member of SDAR and some other groups as well. So take this kind of opportunity to, well, as we wrap it up to tell us a little bit more about yourself and maybe leave us um, with you know one or two final thoughts. Yeah, no, the school. My parents always taught me the value of education. Um, so thank you, Uncle Sam. When I joined the Navy, the Navy paid for not just an undergrad, but um, as I transitioned out, I got an MBA at UCLA, and then I got a master's degree in real estate. And yes, there is a master's degree in real estate. I did that at the University of San Diego. Um, so that's kept me pretty busy the last half, half decade or so, along with the Navy Reserves, uh, along with being a member of the Association's Legislative Steering Committee, along with growing the business uh, that I have in real estate brokerage, uh, specializing in the sale of two to four unit investment properties and building out the Capital Realty Group over the last couple of years. And also I've got a high school daughter. And as we all know, you only get to raise kids once. So I've been doing my uh, best spending time with her over the last uh, five, 10 years, her whole life really. And I've been a volunteer high school archery coach at her high school. And um, we made it to nationals the year before COVID. And even during the year of COVID, we did it a bit until it, COVID really shut things down. And fortunately, this year was my daughter's senior year, a lot of it at home. But we were able to put the high school archery team together during the last few months of the school season. And uh, all those girls, you including brand new freshmen uh, at, at the OLP High School, got to do some outdoor uh, comp competitive archery. So it's a lot of fun. I always, you know me, I always believe in uh, giving back to people and what you put out in this world, you will get back to you. That is for sure. Well, that's really cool. And archery is really cool, by the way. It's a unique sport. Yeah. yeah. Especially for high school kids. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Patrick, so much. We really appreciate your time. Um, if you're watching this and you aren't a member of the association and you want to know more, please visit our website, www.socalrha.org. You can also watch this video and others like it on our YouTube page. Again, just go to YouTube and search SoCal RHA. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And thanks again, Patrick. We'll talk soon. Thanks. You're welcome, Molly.